Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the 10th Science Outreach Talk for Inspire MT. And today we have Kat Kutai, who is going to be talking about the truth telling in science. Kat is a lecturer here at Charles Darwin University in Information Technology. Thank you, Kat. Thank you, Carla. And thank you for coming today. I hope you, um, I can make this slightly interesting talk. I'm recently to Darwin, so a lot of my stories are from New South Wales, where I came from, but I am starting to learn the local stories. And that doesn't work, so I'll try this. No, what should I click? Ah, it's rolling, ha! <laughs> I'd like to acknowledge the Larrakia people of Darwin and uh, acknowledge the elders past and present. And particularly, I'd like to acknowledge that in this region around Darwin, you'll see that there's an enormous number of language groups. So that this was a very rich area, very a lot of different types of animals and plants that people were maintaining and different landscapes that people were looking after. So they formed different groups around that, which I'll be talking about. And also like to acknowledge the elder Auntie Billawara Lee, who's the Larrakia elder here at university, who is reclaiming this language of hers. And also acknowledge the up and coming leaders. Chris Matthews is a mathematician from Kwandamuk, uh, Kwandamuk fellow from Minjera, which is Stradbroke Island, and he teaches math through song and dance. So he brings to mathematics an indigenous perspective that is in, in enabling a lot more people to learn maths than were previously. So this is the sort of process that I'm looking for and trying to promote. I also want to acknowledge a musician, Eric Avery, who came up from Sydney earlier this year. He is um, a classical violinist and a composer. And again, the opportunities that have been opened up to Aboriginal people over the last you know, generation or so are showing a marked response amongst the community and the sort of skills that people are taking up. And I think it's really exciting. But in acknowledging the land, I want to also acknowledge the Aboriginal relationship to land. In 2017, Ray Tobler, an Aboriginal geneticist, published an article in Nature. It was his work on the mitochondria genome of hair samples collected in the 1900s. So the hair samples were well located around Australia. He analyzed them and found that there were particularly genome patterns that were present in different areas of Australia for 49 to 50,000 years. So that Aboriginal people moved to particular areas of land and stayed in this particular type of landform for 45 to 50,000 years. It's not just that they're in Australia, but they learned a particular type of country and wildlife in that time. So the Aboriginal science I want to talk about is an, a science of observation and verification. It um, uses protocols to pre preserve knowledge so that it has its peer reviews, it has its um, objectification methods. Uh, it particularly emphasizes sustainable methods and that's a one to, to talk about that. Also, how is such a knowledge system governed? How do you, what's the governance for it and governance for the sustainability and best practice? And how can we regain this knowledge? and particularly through narrative teaching. So when talking, doing storytelling, we acknowledge that there are certain ways of having authority to give stories. So around Australia there's different ways, but one of them is you can be from the country where the story is located, such as where you're living, but not necessarily where you're descended from. So this could be a non-Aboriginal person who is working with an Aboriginal person says, oh, here's my story, you can share it. So this can be shared, there's an authority to share. Or it can be related by family to a person from the story, a person having close family ties to that place. Or it could be from the country where the story is located, linked through clan or language, so fairly distant. Or it could be a member of the clan or group who are involved in the story, because often the stories will talk about a particular clan group or a kinship group as the main characters. And that means you are linked through your kinship to that character, it is your story because you are that, that kinship. Or you can be personal involvement in the story because the stories are layered through time. So you might've come across one part of that story in your time. And so you'd be part of it. And each level you get more and more responsibility for maintaining that story as true. If you're involved in a story, you're not going to gossip. You're not going to change it. You're going to keep it pure and clean and true. And that is why this system was set up. And in fact, there's a whole lot of um, areas around keeping an authentic oral history. There's your relationship to the story, as I mentioned, so your right to tell the story. There's a language for expressing the knowledge around the country. So if you are living in a certain area of country, you've got the language to talk about that country, you've got the language to tell the story. The language can be about land. 
which was often not changing, but cyclical. So you have the language to say what part of the cycle we're in, what, what's the season, what's the climate, what's happening. But also in authentic oral sharing, you have to have the trust in learning. So the time to listen, that you can learn and trust the people you're learning from and trust in teaching in the sense that you can show people and learn from observation, not just, just questioning, answering interchange. And collaborative storytelling, so that if you have a gut feeling, you think you've seen something, you've got some understanding, check with other people. Have they seen the same thing? Have they felt the same thing? And it becomes a, a, um, objective knowledge through this process. So as well as the protocols of who can tell a story, there's a whole lot of protocols of engagement in Aboriginal society that you've probably heard about if you tried to done an Aboriginal ethics application. And the reason for it is often around this keeping the knowledge authentic or keeping the control of knowledge with the community. It's not just to be respectful, it's because it's really important if you're going to keep an oral knowledge robust and valid. And so there's these protocols of engagement are you know, really useful for society. Therefore, they're saying, well, why don't you all follow this, please, when you deal with us, follow these protocols, because they're important, they're useful. So I should give my authority to tell. I am a saltwater person of Celtic and Pacific origin. I have uh, links to the Bunjilung Yugambe people of the southern Queensland, northern New South Wales coast, which may be Aboriginal or may be New Caledonian. So I have worked with community around Sydney and Redfern since the 80s as a technician at Koori Radio, Radio Redfern and um, campaigning for the campaign for the Royal Commission for Deaths and Custody. So I've been a long time involved in activities. And my interest is what I learned as a kid in the, the stories and the way of life. I want to share with other people. I want this knowledge as part of Australian culture out there and shared. And as an engineer, we talk a lot about teaching sustainability and we do it very badly. So I've pushed it. Well, this is a way we can teach sustainability better. And I'm using an example around fire burning, but just first I want to, again, hark back to this idea of land and how people lived on the land. Because you had your summer um, cottage by the river. And then when, when it was spring, you want to move up the, the mountains. So you'd, you'd move off, but you'd, you'd leave your house to degrade back into the soil. All the, any other rubbish that you'd built up from food or stuff would, would degrade back into the soil. So you'd, you'd let it go clean again. You'd plant a few yams and bushes and stuff for when you came back, there'd be food there. And then you'd go off the mountains and start to learn about how the country was going up the mountains. So you'd move around your boundaries, you'd move around your country, but at all times you'd be not being too heavy on the land, it was called. So, this was a very sustainable way of life. It wasn't nomadic. It was walking your boundaries. So um, now with, oh, this is very sad. My animation doesn't work, so I'll describe it. But so with sustainability is about complex systems, so understanding systems. Now systems are made up of agents. And these agents, we may either have programmed ourselves. This is a little animation where the, the black dots shoot out these gliders. And as the gliders meet, they, they, program the black, they program how can black and white dots sequentially form based on their neighbours. So they form according to their neighbours, like that life game. And these neighbours then come off as little moving particles. So it looks like it's created life, simply from the rules of the game. It, it creates this lifelike little objects. So each agent just follows a set of rules and creates an interactive living system. Now in sustainability, we're trying to go the other way. We don't know the rules, we don't know the interactions. And that's what we're doing. We're trying to find it the other way. So I'm referring to Victor Stephenson's work. He was the fellow on Q&A who said with fire burning, if you want to um, solve the problem of the raging fires in Australia, if you want to have good fire management, let us take the driver's seat. Let us manage it because we have the knowledge. And I want to just explain from New South Wales the knowledge, and you'll see it won't apply here, just some idea of the complexity of the sort of knowledge of fire systems. So you've got the diversity in the agents. We're looking for the agents in the system. Often for Western fire burning techniques, it's focusing on the fuel load. But really Aboriginal people look at the animals and plants in the environment before, during, and after the fire. So the kangaroo eats the young shoots. Well, that stops the trees spreading out. So you've got, uh, well, keeps the trees spread out. So they don't, not so many packed together. The wombats dig into the ground as aerates the soil. It turns it over, increasing soil moisture. You've got more moist under, under ground. Goannas feast off burnt carcasses, so there's a certain wildlife that you're promoting even through fires. 
Um, and the trees can be fire retardant in the bark. So there's a whole lot of factors that, uh, these are again from New South Wales particular ones. So a fire is connected as a system. So all these agents are interconnected. When a fire comes, it can come through the undergrowth, through the load, or it can come as through ladders up the tree if you've got too many young trees close to the bigger trees. It can spread through the canopy, or it can spread subterranean if you, if you have a dry underneath. So there's so many ways that fire can spread. And then we know from the New South Wales fires that once you have a high fuel load, the, the winds uh, created by the, the heat will um, scatter the, the embers and will actually cause these lightning storms that um, were flying about 330 k's ahead of the fire and creating fire front and creating more fires through lightning. So it is a highly volatile and dangerous system. And so people learned to manage this system. Also the lack of water, of course, we have down there. So people were looking at the interactions. How do these components interact? They're related to each other, but they also interact with each other. The tree bark is a fire retardant, so it can block this ladder from the floor to the canopy. The trees that are dispersed do not allow the fire to spread through the canopy. Moisture in the soil prevents underground tr transmission of the fire, so it blocks at lumber roots. And then after the fire, you've got this carbon dug into the soil was creating fertilizer. So people would hand dig the carbon back in. It was a whole process of regeneration. And they knew that many plants would regenerate at this time after the rain. And the scavengers would flood, flourish on car carcasses. So there was an understanding of the whole system at all times, focusing on the whole system. And so the country adapted for sustainability. As we know, Australia was adapted for these mosaic fire burns. Life had reached a stable point where the feedback loops were balanced by the control and management of the fires. And this is actually Victor Stephenson's, the work he was doing the elders to GIS locate the fire burns they did, the cool fire burns, to show where, and to plan, to plan where they'd do it next and to show where they'd burn, to see if they could reduce the large fires. So they use a lot of GIS technology to show the success of their fire burning regimes. And all this is linked to the UN Sustainability Development Goals. This is part of what we have signed up to, what we want to achieve. We should be really promoting this sort of work. But also these goals map very closely to the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, the right to language, the right to live on country, the right to care country, the right to have that knowledge. And this also the right to self-governance. So what, how was this knowledge managed? Well, when the bunion nuts are ripe up the clarence, and that's about every three years, and that's a bunion nut tree, I've learnt now how to identify what is not a bunion nut tree. So I'm, I'm getting there. It's that little crown, it's beautiful. So there's a bunion nut tree, very good you know, heart, um, food, food source. Or the bogon moths are massing in Canberra. If you can eat bogon moths, you could go to Canberra for the bogon moth feast. And the fish, are, or if the fish are running up the Barden River, in the Borana fish traps, which have been dry for months of this year, last year, but we have now started to get a bit of rain back. So when these feasts were there, people could gather and share their stories. And it wasn't, it was quite um, a detailed process. It was very formal and organized and there were protocols for it because the elders came as experts of their totem. So they provide their diversity of views, their diversity of experience. There was kinship relationships between the clans. So the totems, people could come from different clans, so they all would be the same totem, but quite from dispersed, and they could bring together knowledge about that particular animal or plant. And so it provided a connectedness across the country. And the stories tell relationships between people and the environment, such as through the moiety. The moiety is like the yin-yang. You've got a one side and the other side, the saltwater grass, the freshwater grass, these sort of things. That told of the interactions. So all the stories people share were about the interactions in the environment. How were things progressing? How were they changing? Then the corroboree was designed around what is the state of time we're in now? What, what's happening at the moment? What's the season like? What's the weather like? What's happening? What's part of the cycle we're in? And then they'd present the stories about where we are now and how to manage this time. And so that was, that was how we, we learned, we taught. So one of the contributions to this knowledge system was, as I mentioned, the Borana fish traps. And I'm gonna mention them later, but I wanted to just explain that these were um, dry wall, which, uh, dry stone wall constructions, which were very wet, but dry in the sense of no mortar. 
which have stood there for possibly 40,000 years, being rebuilt every time people came back to meet, but generally withstanding the strong currents. And they were built all up from this a large expanse of the river. This was a weir that was built across when Europeans came and they took a lot of the stones to build that and of course it clogged up the river. But these weirs were some during the low, low side of the water and some at the high, so when the waters first came and high water, these would be slightly under and they could store the fish here. When the waters dropped, the ones lower down would be the ones where they'd store the fish. So the, these weirs, you open one end, the fish would come in, they'd be stored there for people to eat for as long as they needed for the ceremony. And they were very successful fish traps. But I'll be talking more about that. So There's also one thing, a story from up here, Michael Christie told me about the Yongle people. They have this belief in, or understanding of incoherence in knowledge, in, in management, in governance. They say, we'll never agree, tensions will always remain. Our role is to achieve decisions at a time and place that works for them, that particular time. This is because the decision will be based on who is there, so it won't work later when you get other people coming along, which is, I think, really pragmatic in terms of how you manage. So there's no one simple answer, just a process to manage the incoherence. And then along came COVID and the health workers came out and they drove into the community, went up to the health center where the elders are sitting around waiting for any news. And they walked in, talked to the health worker, walked out and went away. And the elders are going, well, what's happening? You know, wouldn't you talk to us? Because the elders are the ones who manage the people, who explain the disease to people, explain where the, why you're not, don't run out of the community, you're not going to be locked in, you, you're here to stay in the community, it's for safety. Um, how to get food and sanitary items to the community when they weren't even available in town. All these problems were not handled well. And we've had the repeat of the exactly same problem down in Victoria in the, the towers, where people did not consult the community, did not consult the elders, and just thought, well, there's one process. We go out, we shut down the community, in it. but it's not. It's a whole consultant process, accepting some in incoherence and difference between communities and managing that. So what happened to this observational knowledge? What happened to this science? Well, Bruce Pascoe has a really good observation in his book from one of the diaries, where I think it was probably at the budgebeam yield traps that this young fellow was fishing and he had a, a pole stuck down in the water and it was looped over a hook in the water. And as a fish came through the, one of those traps, it would, it would um, or probably not, probably just the wall trap, the weir, it would hit the, the, the name for the, the twine, hit the twine and pull it and pull it off such thing and this, uh, the spring would fling up and drop the fish beside him and then he'd set the trap again. And so the European observer said, I've often heard of the indolence of the blacks and soon came to the conclusion that after watching a black fella catch a fish in such a lazy way that I'd heard was perfectly true. It's certainly a perspective you can take on a technology that was being used, a very good technology. And this was um, the European observer James Kirby, as quoted by Bruce Pascoe. So we now can have a good idea of where the, all this observational science went. It went into hiding. And so we're saying now, what would we know now if Cook had listened? Now he did listen to the navigators. He knew he needed the navigators. So he got them to help him up and down the coast. He would pin, um, steal people, he, he enslaved them and took them on his boat to be a navigators. But also the Aboriginal people knew when he was coming because they sent signals up and down the coast that he was coming, or that the barber's coming, we can get a haircut. You know, sort of, it, was, it was known who these people were. People were in control then. But the knowledge to manage the land was ignored, the fire burning, digging the ash back into the land to make this, this has become a very poor soil country because of the lack of fertilizer. Well, now he's young fertilizer, but it was, it was rich at the time that the Europeans came because the oil, the carbon had been put back in and the sustainable use of resources, all lost. And the way of sharing that knowledge was you know, lost to the Europeans, but it was still maintained in communities. And we say the land retains the knowledge because it's not lost, it's still there in the land. And if you go back to people who go back to their country and stay on their country, say they start to learn again how to look after that country. And partly because the language, the country is based around the landforms. 
these country, land language groups are in coastal areas, the desert languages, the northern tropical languages. Those language groups actually form patterns based around land types and land forms and land areas. The people stayed in one area and learnt that area and their language was built around that area. So very much the knowledge is in the language. And so we really want to try and reclaim those languages where we can to talk this knowledge again. But also it's interesting because the land will define language we've found. There was a study done uh, between the Apache and the Hopi languages in the US. Now the Apache are fairly recent revivals, about 15 to 20,000 years ago, you know, fairly recent comers. And their, their language, they talk about big, big tall red cliffs and deep green valleys is translated literally to the name of places. So places are named, you can sort of tell from translation what the name is. When you get the Hopi language, it's so old that language has no, that word has no meaning except that place. And you get these words that are just the name of that place. And that's where that idea of spiritualism, that the deep connection comes from the language. And it's the same in Aboriginal languages, that place names have such a meaning, they are just that place. And it means a, a lot to a person to name their country and name their places. But also in desert languages, there's affordances, you can see much more because it's so different to you know, where I came from. There are affordances of the landscape where you, you've got um, in a desert, if you've got a hill up or a hill down, it's all much the same. You're gonna have to go up if you go down, you're gonna have to you know, go up. It, it, it's expenditure of water, it's, it's an effort. So you've got undulating, you don't necessarily have words for hills or valleys, you just have word undulating, so undulating country, so it's hard to traverse or it's, it's flat country. So the language around the country will just be defined by the country you're describing. And even places like Fitzroy River, when it's dry, most of the year, this area, as you can see, there's, there is a bridge across when, for when it's wet, but it's mostly dry. Then this river is a river. It's still a river, everyone calls it a river. And then suddenly people, even in English, will go, oh, the river was running the other day, you had a river running. And for other people, well, of course rivers run, but no, river means a big flat area which will occasionally get water during heavy rain. So it becomes a different meaning because you have a different use to what a river is. But also it's interesting that there were recordings made of English speakers in World War II by the Germans. They were collecting um, sort of how to talk in England if they went there, they were planning to be there in mass. And they recorded the different regions of England. So the Welsh accent is a nice lilting accent of the rolling hills of Wales. And the Scottish accent was a bit more lilty of the highlands of, the, of Scotland. And the English northeast is the flat lands that we've inherited in our flat lands, which is really flat and really dull and no tonal variation. The tone of the languages actually matched the land that these people come from, which is just an odd sort of thing that people pick up from their land. So yes, your language is very much tied to your land. So then so is the knowledge. So we had these, so then people say, well, we only want to share our knowledge in the country we were talking about because it's tied to that country. We don't want to be sharing it everywhere else. And we've got the Dreamtime stories, which are about that country and how it works. So they were, actually the Dreamtime stories are simplified knowledge systems. And I use that word, even though it's been denigrated, because it's the best way of describing a story that is in the past, the present, the future. It's still ever going, it's constant, it doesn't change. Its nuances will change and you will learn more about it as you grow, but it's always there. And it's always based around some theme or location. So they provide the knowledge to navigate or live on the country or the guidance rules like fighting or greed. And they relate to governments in that society, in that, that group there. They're not designed only to assist the teller to remember details. So, so the thing about the story is they're a bit like Cicero's memory palace. They're located on certain landscape features. So if you're walking through the country, you'll start telling a story and you'll use the landscape to remind yourself of features of the story to tell. So they're actually very good for helping you remind to transmit knowledge from the story. But also for the listener to gather the information together and remember it, they also gather those features. And there's certain receptors in the feature. So if you say, come up here and say, oh, this is where the kangaroo were eating the berries. And there's a lot of berry bushes there. Well, later someone else will come along and they, they will be the berry pers the person with the knowledge of the berry story. And they will tell you about those berries and how they grow and when they grow and when they, when they flower. And 
when, when the particular yellow flower comes up, then you, women shouldn't swim in the river. And things like that will come out. But it'll all be from this same story that will you know, have these embedded in it. So when you hear another version, they'll link to these relevant receptors. So your knowledge will grow from all well, your textbook. And the story is always incomplete. It's up to the listener to make what they want of the story, what they can understand from the story given them. It's not didactic, it's explanatory and descriptive and very much depends on the learner's understanding that it's, it's a, um, the learner is the one that will understand it. It comes based from your experience. But also these stories about way of bringing people into culture, how the young people were brought into culture. And we stopped that process. We said, oh, well, you know, Dreamtime stories, not relevant. But they're really important to learn, to get part of the culture and to understand the whole values and the systems. And these stories have layers. So the first layer is teach the young about the environment and basic moral values. Then as you grow older, you teach the youth about relationships between people and community. Greedy and thing. Teach young adults and then the next layer, and this is the same story, same people telling the story, but it depends who's listening, what they will understand. So you teach young adults about relationship between a community and the wider world, starting to expand the knowledge. And these same stories teach the older people about spiritual knowledge. Depending how much you've heard the story, you'll have heard the spiritual knowledge, but you probably don't, wouldn't understand if you weren't old enough. So it's, it's a way of telling without telling if you don't know, if you're not ready to understand. So these are the repositories of knowledge. And we're trying to, develop, to share those. So we're sharing stories on location where we can. And Google Maps has been a great vehicle for that. So we use that a lot. So we're developing games, interactive displays of stories linked to country. This is based on the ocean currents and it's indigenous stories around the world. So you click on the icon, and you can get the story from these different places about the effect of the ocean currents on the climate and the effect of the climate on the ocean currents. So we're collecting this as, as part of a journal paper, journal paper we put in. Um, another one is this, it's a surround display. This on the left, that is actually Tasmania, a 3D model of Tasmania coming up from the Antarctic past Tasmania and Australia's a bit in the distance there. So you're actually traveling across Australia and these rocks are places where you can hear stories. So there's stories located on different places around the map and you can actually encounter them in the, in the, the pedestrian it's called. And part of the idea of the pedestrian is as you listen to the stories, you actually gather items on your body. So your body start, your, your avatar starts to light up at the joints as you've got this knowledge and you start to carry it with you. And so you then become a way of collecting and then combining that knowledge. And the stories are combined science and Aboriginal stories, again, trying to map things like graph of the, graph of the sea rise over the years, maps a lot to Aboriginal stories, but I'll talk a bit about that. I find another one is this game on Darug, the language of Sydney that wasn't spoken except in a bit of pidgin for a oh, hundred years or so. It was one that, it was never recorded because it was, you know, white people were suffered smallpox before there's much recordings done. But it is now spoken. And we've got a game in Darug, and this is now Wumava Gadigal Nurda. Gadigal is part of the Darug near the eastern Sydney. And they're saying, I'm flying over Gadigal country. And he's actually coming towards the um, Woolamaloo, which is a place of many whales. So there's some whales coming out. And he's going to, when he arrives at that rock, he'll talk about Woolamaloo. So it's you know, talking about the place where he is. And so why I call it truth telling. In the present social environment, we're dealing with major crisis that requires greater trust. Yet we're in a period of trust deficit. And I believe that people's, first people's methods provide formats which retain to truth and communication. I met a, a Arapaho woman who came over to Australia to, with her father was a Arapaho teacher. He was reclaiming the language, it was a language that was dying out in the US and he was reclaiming it. And he taught her on a plane, I really taught her a, a, a story, like a myth and legend, like one of their dream time stories. And so she recited it in Arapaho and then he said, oh, could you translate it? So she translated it and she was, you know, thinking and translating and translating. I went up to her after and said, you know, I speak different languages and it's really interesting. How do you feel when you speak 
a rapport as opposed to how you feel when you speak English. Because you know, English is a great language. You, know, you can say, well, I'm going to take your children away and I'm going to rape your women and I'm going to kill your men. And you can't really complain because I'm telling you quite nicely. It's a very diplomatic language. We'll be very plain and open and tell you exactly what we're going to do and what can you do. So I asked her that and she said, when I speak Arapaho, I feel like I'm talking the truth. You're talking about the land. You're talking about what's around you. You're talking about how things are. You're not embellishing. You're not saying your own view. You're saying what's out there. And she said, I feel like I'm telling the truth. And that's stayed with me a lot because how can we emulate that? How can we have people talking the truth and respecting each other that way? So we now have people calling for scientific evidence to guide the politicians. But equally important is evidence on the perspectives around social and environmental issues. The, these are equally part of the science of what's, where to go in the future. And I'm linking this to the Makarata Commission because the truth applies not just to treatment of our first peoples, but also in respecting the truth of knowledge that resides in that community for sustaining the environment that we all share. So this is another important truth that we really need to consider. And stories are history. They tell the life of a community, not just an individual. So the Gadigal story of Sydney is that when the waters were rising and the Gadigal people had to move inland, they went to the Darug and they said, uh, we're losing our land, it's going underwater, what can we do? And the Darug said, well, you can have this basin for as long as you need. And that basin is Sydney Basin. The Gadigal were people living on the, the continental shelf off, off the coast. There's stories of various islands that are now under sea in the, the sunken river of Sydney Harbour. David Nathan is a linguist and computer science uh, person working in Grutaland. And he told me, he went up there to collect some language and I was talking to a woman and said, what's the word for water? And she gave him a water, uh, gave him a word. And this woman from the community was helping him said, oh, that's the water, word for fresh water under the sea. And he went, what? She said, oh, yeah, it's very useful in times of drought. We can take a, a shell and put it over the fresh water under the sea and grab some and take it out. There's springs that are now under the sea. But the community remembers where they were. Well, it's very useful survival. But it also, as David said, it's the idea, you've got your own personal narrative. Oh, when I was a young kid, I used to play over here and there were these trees. And I, that's your identity. You build up, well, so is the community. The community got its identity. It's built up an image of itself through its life and it knows that there was time when they were out on that continental shelf or walking between the islands because it was so shallow. The community knows that. That was just their youth. It was only 15,000, 11, 15,000 years ago. It's not long ago. But also they know the stories of the massacres. I was brought up knowing the stories of the massacres. I knew the family was killed in massacres. It's... Aboriginal people grow up knowing that. So when we talk about truth-telling, it's, it's the non-Aboriginal people who were able to not know it. Aboriginal people know it all their life. It's just part of life. You know that history. It's not ever been denied. It's been a very split culture. It's just sad that the lack of sharing, and this really has got to change. But also, if I can look at it, Stories are a way of teaching, and I'm going to play part of this video. This is again about Bwarana, about the fish traps. It's a dream time story as told to children. But then I'm going to ask you for some points that might have come out of it. Or may I show you, because I don't think I hid them. <laughs> I'm going to actually show you some points that came out of it. So, yeah, if you don't allow me to just play this for three minutes, and then um, I'll show you something that was all the knowledge that was in there. For thousands of years, our elders have told us many stories of how our country came to be. We have been told in the beginning there was just flat red ground. We were told this was the beginning of our dream time. Many things happened in our dream time. We have been told that by army, had entered the land of the moon and the sun. Mm -hmm. 
We have been told that by army on walkabout took a giant step from Kobar to Gandabuka, the sacred place of the Nimba people. And then he stepped over to Bairo, where he left the mark of his footprint on a stone. And then he came here to Brewarana. He stopped at the water hole known as the Garangra, and he was mighty hungry. He looked around and behind the rock wall, he saw a large black fish swimming in a pool of water. He raised his spear and struck the fish. But he was only wounded that black fish. He took off, crashing through the rock wall down there and the water came gushing out after him. That fish, he burrowed deep into the hard ground to get away from Bayami. But Bayami, he would have none of that. He dug after that black fish, cutting into the hard ground, making large holes in the earth. And as he chased the wounded fish, the rushing waters filled in the holes. Bayami chased that black fish for a long, long time. See those bends? Well, that black fish, he made those bends as he tried to escape. And do you know what happened to that black fish? Well, he got away. But that doesn't matter, because my army and that black fish created our mighty river, which runs as far as the eye can see. And so for a while, life for our people was good. Then the big dry set in. The sun was scorching our earth and our waters were shrinking. Our people faced a famine. If there is no water, there is no food, no animal life, our people could die. Biami found out and he returned to Brewarana with his two sons. Biami and his sons were so strong and they scattered large stones and dug up boulders, setting them out into the pattern of a great fishnet. These fishnets became our nunu. But still no water. And that evening the people gathered on the river bank and held a big crobbery for Biami and his sons. Biami took a coolerman and showed the old men how to call the rain. For hours the ground rumbled under the old men's stamping feet, kicking up the dust which rose high. Exhausted, the old men fell to the ground, and while they slept, the dust clouds drifted higher and higher, swirling around Balu, the moon, who filled those dust clouds with rain, and then drop, drop, drop. The rain, it poured down for days. The people watched as the water rushed into the Durangra, over the rock wall, and covered by army stone fish traps, the Nunu. Now, Aunty June Parker isn't Nimba, the people of the traps, but she's brought up, grew up in that area. And so what, I, what it probably is, is not necessarily a, um, no, not necessarily a traditional story, but is a very good story for passing on the science of the area. Firstly, the landforms in the area. If a kid gets lost, they start to know the area, how to get back home. The army created the traps. It's beyond memory. Often stories will have some historic figure, like kinship figure or something, that did this or did that sort of activity. No, this is by army, beyond that. That means that traps are probably about 40,000 years ago, but we're trying to establish it. How do you travel, establish the age of a pile of rocks unless you get under them, I suppose, but we're still not sure how to. The black perch going underground may refer to aquifers in the area. People have been known to, um, I had a, a geologist was working over in the Pilbara and the, the mining company was planning a mining of a certain area and people were sitting in the bush talking to him way down over another side. And they said to him, no, they can't do that because the water will come here and damage this place and it's very special, a lot of growth here, a very important place for us. So that's way up there. And he was a geologist. He'd previously done the surveys of that area. So he went and checked and there was underground aquifer from that mine to where they were sitting. Um, 
The eggs survive underground. Aboriginal people do collect the uh, eggs of that cod and take them up and distribute them up the river. So they know that they, once underground, they do survive. And also this was pointed out to me when I did this talk at another university with a lecturer as a biologist. And he said, and do you know their final lesson? He said, how do we make rain? We seed the clouds. I was out at Barwarina, we during the last droughts. And just with the wind storms, there was this rising dust storm that goes as high as the clouds. You do get it. And you do possibly get cloud seeding. <clears throat> In fact, we did get a cloud, some rain when we were there, from, possibly from the cloud seeding. So it is possible that, you know, a good corroboree, stirring up some dust could cause some cloud, some rain. And maybe there's other things that we don't know that is going on. But I have been, I gave fire stories and I often talk about the kangaroo, hence my shirt. I talk about those stories because it's clear I have no right to tell them. The fire story is a man's story. The kangaroo story is a man's story because that's what men do. They hunt anim the large animals. They have that knowledge, so you need that knowledge. The water is a woman's story. So Tiddlick the Frog, it was a story. It's one of the ones that people teach as a dream time story. They grow and expand as the listener grows, as I said, and it's about caring for the country in every detail. So, if it, do people know the Tiddlick, the frog story? It's about greed. It's about not sharing for the kids. It's about um, you know, loss of water and the effect of loss of water on the community. And it's about how a community can get together to achieve what they need for the community. And so you could compare Tiddlick the frog to the Murray Daly Basin Catchment Authority. Because as I said, the Boron fish traps were dry for a long time. And that was the water was going to the uh, cotton farms and the, the, all the, the irrigation channels all up the river. And again, there was rain recently and it started flowing for a while and then it was all taken out again, the irrigation channels. So we've got a Murray Daly Catchment Authority that's acting very similar to Tiddlick the frog. And so he was thirsty, so he drank all the water and the other animals had none. So what happens with Tidlick? Maybe that can happen with the Murray Darling Basin Water Management System. All the animals gather together, but this made no difference to Tidlick. You know, he didn't really care. He didn't care about them. He was on the money. And, but then the kookaburra was, kookaburra said, well, we've got to make him laugh because that's what kookaburras know about. Uh, laughing, he can't keep the water down if it makes him laugh. But they all tried to make him laugh, but he didn't laugh until the snake actually touched him, gave him a friendly pat on the stomach. And so when the water flowed from Tiddlick, it was shared with all animals. And for, but why wasn't Tiddlick sharing before? Why would he share just because someone gave him a friendly pat? Well, I think it's when I grew up, I saw the story from the other side. I thought for, for Tiddlick, Tiddlick, what's his problem? What, why, why does he feel? What? And he felt very isolated. I mean, no one cared about him, just a bit, big, ugly frog, or maybe a cane toad, and I certainly don't like them. But then he wasn't included in, in his decisions. And then people came around and suddenly wanted to include him only because he had their water. You know, who cares? But when people consult, when they involve you, when they really understand you and engage with you and maybe not in COVID touch you, but sort of certainly get close to you and feel for you, then people will start sharing. I can actually get some a chance of not reducing this greed. I mean. So we're trying to bring this into education, teaching the community, teaching our students, teaching just generally, looking at indigenous knowledge across the curriculum. So language must be a component of that process, speaking the language, re respecting the language. Location and affiliation to land uses the language of that land. You need it to explain the land. And talking about weather and climate changes uses the stories of the country. So again, you need all that. And we're using kinship as an example of collaborative work in teams. When I was traveling around remote communities as an engineer, I, I was given a kinship system over in the Pilba. And so when I went to Western Desert, I could say, oh, I'm Bungu of the Bar uh, Banjama nation, Burungu. So I'm Burungu. And they said, oh, so the angel. 
So the idea is that you will then have a relationship to anyone you come into contact with. That means they know how to relate to you. They know this, this mob, they're your, they're your brothers and sisters. You can talk, sit down and talk to them. This mob, they're your parents. They'll tell you what to do. That mob, they're, they're straight. You can be cheeky to them. And that's, that's across the whole community. Everyone's got one of these relationships with you. And the best thing is that mob, you're, they're your in-laws. Do not talk to them. If they come into the shop, walk out. If they come near, just go away. I think it's the most clever culture that I've ever heard. I can tell that to an older audience. I tell it to the young ones and they go, what's he talking about? Well, you'll find out. <laughs> um, and so the, that's, that when I was, had another friend who was working at Bachelor and he was collecting stories and this old woman started telling the story and he knew it was a very important one. And he said, but you haven't told your daughter that story. He said, oh, no, I can't. She's not ready to hear it. But you're okay. You're not human. You can sort of be a repository for it. He's going, what do you mean I'm not human? Well, you have no kinship. You're not part of our society, our culture, so you're not human. It was really good turning around of that perspective that's always been promoted as to who is human and who is not. And so, well, if you don't fit into the culture, well, what are you? And so I teach kinship in terms of how's your, what's your relationship to people? Really respect that relationship and keep that through the whole team and act out your role in that team. Respect it. But obviously there's a lot more, and Kelly reminded me, I, that's not all, there's a very more to it, which is about relation, relationality and respect for others to promote more trust in public life. And that's you know, what we want to aim. And one other thing I really forgot that I will throw in was at the Borana, they were one, as I said, they were one of the people that um, hosted the corroborees. So they had a whole lot of um, people coming into country and sharing knowledge and sharing stories. They are now working on an IT um, uh, digital hub where people will come in and collaborate with their stories and share their stories. And then they can make packages like to sell to Qantas for tourists or to sell language packages to school. So they're now maintaining exactly that same focus of, and skill in a totally new domain. And I think it's a really exciting project that they're doing. So that's, that's the sort of projects we're working on too. So and I think that is all, yep. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I can't roll. <laughs> it's wrong. Thank you, Kat. That, that was really amazing. A oh, very interesting talk. Um, we start with the people here in the audience and see you, and then we'll move to the ones online. Does anyone has a question here? more of a comment I mean particularly about the fire thing I mean um, I guess anyone who's lived up here in the top end for a while realizes and, and what's his name Victor whatever came up here and came up here and talked at the fire forum which was great but you know we've had fire management particularly in Arnhem and things now going on 15 20 years and um, it took a while for all that to get set up and it's not um, it's not traditional burning in the sense that, you know, they use helicopters and they use all the rest of it. But what's important is there's a lot of planning goes into it, a lot of thought goes into it. And it's the people that actually live in the country that understand the country that, that do it and that understand it. And I think, I don't know how you get that kind of message across to, and I think it's also a lot more complicated in Southeastern Australia, like where you've got a big area of Aboriginal land, it's basically up to those people to do what they want. Whereas, and I, I just wonder how you, Think you might be able to deal with that in the, you know in the context of sort of South, particularly the eastern seaboard. Yeah, I I should have prefaced that. I did sort of say, yeah, I'm coming from New South Wales. I do know up here you have had fire management for a long time, and it's brilliant. And as you say, it's managed by Aboriginal people. The, the Aboriginal people run, are driving it. In Victor Sifferson's worked a bit with New South Wales people, and that's what I was trying to explain the difficulty of it is, well, he knew none of that knowledge, so he has to come into the community going. Um, so what's your weeds, um, what's your wet plants, what's your dry plants, what's your... Cha He's coming without any knowledge, but what he has knows is what are the factors that contribute. So he's worked that way, that's sort of very much pattern matching. And people say that, I've heard people tell me, oh, Aboriginal people can't abstract. And I thought, well, if you're trying to abstract knowledge of country to that depth to another country, it is extremely difficult. But Yes, they're doing that. They're bringing the fire burning uh, techniques back to the countries that um, you know, didn't have it. 
have, or have lost, yeah, I've, I've lost, sorry, didn't have the people before that have who have been running it, but they're starting to reclaim it. And one other th story interesting that came up here was, again, a very early Michael Christie story, was he's working with a scientist before 15 years ago, bringing the scientists up to talk to the Aboriginal people about fire management. And he'd sit them down with the Aboriginal people and he'd go, and they go, okay, when do you start the fire burning? And they go, well, when the turtles are coming up the river. And they go, no, 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 when do you start the fire management? No, okay, not listening. Um, when the dandelions are flowering, and it's interesting because the dandelions are not native, but they do flower at the same time as another yellow flower. So they were using that as a signal of a certain time of year when you start looking at burning. And the scientists were going, oh, this is useless. Yeah, they're not talking about time, but they were, They're, because the time of year changes. It's actually based on what the plants are and what's happening. So yeah, it's been a long process to convey that knowledge from the Aboriginal people to, and that's why Victor was so important because he, he did it with science. Here's the GIS location. Here's what happened. Here's when the burning happened and look what ha effect it had on the fire. So things like that have been really successful, but it is happening, it's already happening. Yeah, and th thank you NT for doing it. Yeah, for starting it. Um, how would you account for possible um, miscommunication or misinterpretation of a certain uh, project between, because you did point out that each trial, each, each community has a different way of speaking and way of understanding the land. So how would you account for possible miscommunication if those two communities were to work together on a certain project? For people coming in from totally outside the area, it's really a long process of listening and of trying to show what you're doing in a way that you're working together. So you co-design, so you do a bit and other people do, and you see how people interact. So it's sort of like human-centered design in a way that is very practical. So you're trying little bits and examples and people, but across communities themselves, well, people speak three or four, five, eight different languages. So originally people would communicate very clearly across the communities but they wouldn't necessarily um, have the not particular, they wouldn't have the right to speak of that land. So they could talk about it to people casually, but when, when they had to come up and speak, the only land they could speak of was their own. So there was that communication sense. People knew, but they didn't have the right to speak it. And that's that distinction, which really helped a lot to keep the knowledge clear. Yeah. Um, when you think it comes to the environment um, that don't have a traditional place or don't have stories attached to them, so say for instance something like Gambara, which is a huge spread up here, how does that become incorporated into the knowledge system and sort of accepted as something that is new that you know, people have a history? Um, again, I haven't, again, not coming from here, I can only postulate that I would understand it would be is that there be stories like it. So the relationship with the gamma grass might come out when you're hunting a certain animal. So you'd then bring it into that story and you say, well, how did we deal with the gamma grass when we went hunting that time? And the problems it made for the gar car and things like that, and the car, motor car is another problem, another new word. So, uh, and, but I must bring up the problem that does happen is you get, you get Creoles. Suddenly the language has to be changed to adapt to these new words and you get what is a Creole. So we are dealing with languages that aren't in the pure form and that's a, a battle to get people to accept that that is a f valid form of communication in traditional language when using new words. That the words part of it is a problem as well as the actual object. So that's what I was saying like um, over in um, Broome, Marshall Langton talks of a story of when um, two young fellows did wrong and were speared near this barb tree. And then later the police came and arrested people. Hundreds of thousands of years later, police came and arrested people and held them prisoner in that biob tree on their way to Broome. That is the story in one place through time. So it starts with the old story, goes to the police arresting and the, the difficulties with police, and then goes on to um, you know, new things about when tribal law, they're starting to bring it back circle hearings and those sort of things. So, the, the stories retain like, like someone's a place location over a theme or they'll be traveling along and you'll describe how the new things you encounter on that travel. So it just becomes incorporated. And that's beautiful narrative. You can incorporate anything into a narrative and it just still flows and you still remember it and share it, yeah. Um, so 
Thank you. Is anybody uh, online that would like to make a question, um, ask something now? Oh, yeah. uh, Sulav has asked, fire management in North Australia has been conducted by indigenous people for thousands of years. What scale has co cross-cultural conflicts have occurred over the years? What were the challenges upon them that arise from difference? in indigenous versus scientific knowledge? I mean, a lot of the cross-cultural conflicts is that lack of listening. That yeah, the non-Aboriginal people came in and thought, well, we can manage it like it was England or something and just started setting up their own techniques without checking what was already there, what was happening. And that idea that the technology was primitive and so to be ignored. Um, so the, also the fact that uh, scientific knowledge from the Western viewpoint is very much breakdown. We will analyze the parts of it. If you can get rid of all the other intervening factors, you can then really analyze this component. Whereas Aboriginal people are exactly the opposite. If we don't understand as a whole and how the, all the interacting parts work, we will never really understand it or be able to do it. And as soon as you start breaking it down, you lose that sustainability and that way to manage sustainably. So that's really yeah, the main disappointment that's arisen in the fact that the you know, people can come in, they'll mine a certain area of country without understanding the effect that that has. And Aboriginal people, the sacred sites are often areas of high mineral content. Uh, Roxby Downs was the story of the yellow-bellied lizard, and that's where the uranium mine is under the ground. And it's yellow-bellied lizard. It, it's, there, there's knowledge that there is a rich deposit there because probably because it's poisonous, if you hang around there. There's the lakes in Cape York, which people say don't swim in. And people go, oh, yeah, we'll swim them, and sometimes they die. They're actually high mineral contents that are poisonous. So it's, it's, there's, there's reasons for these, sac these sacred sites that are, aren't just you know, a long spiritual connection to the country, and the, they know the strength and power of that area. And they're saying, well, watch out, this is a powerful country. So it was ignored. And that disrespect is really crushed people, really hurt people, as much as the massacres in the sense of killing the knowledge, killing the, the society that was managing that country. And the damage to the country is really hurtful because if you've, I mean, I was, I was gonna ask the thing I often do was, you know, 50,000 years in the one area of country. Now suppose your family's lived in an area for what, 20 to 50 years. Maybe your grandparents lived there, maybe their great grandparents. You'd have stories that far back. Imagine if that was 50,000 years and had the stories of that. As I was saying, the stories of the community. Then to lose that to someone who just wants to come and dig a hole in the ground, it's just, yeah, it's just mind boggling. So thanks, thanks Beth, that's my cousin. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, yeah, co cross-cultural conflicts mostly have been around the inability to communicate. So there's become a quite a really big divide. Just people do not meet, do not talk, do not know about each other, do not know about each other's knowledge. I worked in a community where I was um, teaching about radio communication, or well, setting up radio communication. And I went to the project officer and I spoke to about how I could work in the schools and he told me about the teacher. And then I went to an elder in the community and asked, working in the school, and he told me about the teacher. I thought, that's a split personality. No, it was two people. There was the Aboriginal AEA and there was a white teacher. And each part of the community saw one and did not see the other. And that's just how places were run. Yeah. Well, thank you, Kat. That was an amazing talk. And I think we all think thank you for coming here today. Um, the talk will be available online. I just need a few days to get organized, but I'll send you the link once it is. And join us next week for our next talk. I'll send the details soon.